you never want to be a quitter. Set things right, fix things. If you think about why anyone comes to work, four different reasons. One is they love what they do. Number two, they love the people they work with. Number three, they feel like they can learn from the people that they work with. And four, the company is going up and to the right. If one of these four does not work, they will leave. Chandra, I am so excited for this. I heard many good things from Alex Schultz before the show, but thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you so much, Harry. Uh, it's really my honor. I, I love this show. I would say this is my favorite podcast show and I've listened to so many amazing people saying amazing things and I, I've learned so much from this show. So it's truly an honor. Listen, I've, I've learned just as much. So uh, I, I think it's a pretty cool job that I have. I, I would love to start, though, with some chronology. I heard you got some seminal advice uh, early on from one of your managers at PayPal, uh, Rohan. So I'd love to start with this. What was the advice from Rohan at PayPal and how did it change your mindset? Yeah, so I was actually, uh, Rohan was my manager and uh, I, I think he went on to lead uh, a bunch of different teams at, at, at PayPal. And uh, I was... Uh, uh, working in, at, at, at PayPal and was primarily on risk management and doing a bunch of different analysis. I actually got caught in a crossfire between two senior leaders. And what it ended up happening was it became really, really frustrating for me. And uh, I couldn't actually do my work. And uh, basically what I did at that point was I was uh, so frustrated that I wanted to quit. And uh, rather than address the problem, I wanted to quit. And I went and told Rohan and said, you know what? I don't want to stay here. I actually want to quit. And for which he basically said, you know what, you never want to be a quitter. And he said, set things right, fix things, and then when you're in a better state of mind, come back to me and I'll see what I can do. So I stayed on for another six to nine months. And at that point, I got into a much better state of mind, fixed all the issues I had with the senior management, and then fixed the problems there was and tried to get our uh, and actually got uh, the the PayPal trajectory back on track. And then I went back to Rohan six to nine months later and then basically told him, okay, man, I fixed a bunch of different stuff. I, I still feel like PayPal is not the right place for me for several reasons. And, uh, and I told him, I want to go to a different company. And he actually reached out to Facebook and literally got me a job there. I, I do just want to stay on that because that's a really interesting thought of like fix what's broken before moving on. I always think about the opportunity cost of time. Sometimes it can take nine months, 18 months, two years to fix something that's broken. Do you still think that it's worth spending the time to fix it? If bluntly, a lot of it's out of your control and the end state isn't even one that you would want to be in. You know, I mentored a lot of uh, 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 I mean, basically, uh, high school kids and undergraduates. And I tell them the number one most important thing that you need to learn as a, as a kid, especially at their ages, because they're extremely talented, where they're very smart, they can do things, is character building. To me, I think it was a character building exercise. The fact is that you need to build, uh, you, not quitting is a character building exercise. I mean, as we are a child, we are being told, don't lie, which I think is a character building exercise. Uh, just crossing any line that you want to, that, that you think you shouldn't is basically a character building exercise. And I, I think it is a very strong character building exercise for me. So yes, specifically how long it takes, I, I think it's a, it's going to hit you regardless. At some point or other, it's going to hit you if you don't build character. So I think uh, two years would have been a very long time, but I think six to nine months, I think it is worthwhile because otherwise I might never have done it. And that has helped me so much later because when it became very tough situations at Facebook, I knew how to handle it. I didn't back away. I didn't say I would run away from a problem. I stayed on with it. And it was a very, very good six to nine months uh, time spent. Can I ask, what was the toughest situation at Facebook? And how did the preparation that you had before in terms of the character building help you be ready for it? I think the hardest part for me was, uh, was uh, when I was uh, working on a team and it turned out that, uh, that the kind of data that we were actually uh, providing was people in the organization that want, didn't want to see the truth. And I was trying to be a truth speak, truth seeker and say the truth there. And it ended up being that uh, the senior leadership there did not like what I was saying and I almost got fired for it. And uh, But that's when I think people like Harvey and Alex at, uh, at Facebook actually backed me up. 
and uh, and the tr- the trust they they had in me was was amazing and the fact that i didn't actually run away from it and stayed on helped me and the fact that there were people who were willing to back me up to the hilt helped me a lot i mean that's incredible to hear on alex and javi you know, backing you and a challenging situation for sure when you reflect back on that incredible journey because it was an immense journey that you have with facebook what are one or two of your biggest lessons or takeaways do you think a couple of biggest lessons is i think one is uh, focus on impact uh especially after i went to sequoia capital and saw so many companies and then i found out what was the thing that was so different than facebook than any other company it ended up being that it was really the fact that facebook focused on impact and many other companies did not and so that made a material difference in my opinion to what how what is it what does it mean to focus on impact versus not because everyone yeah. says they have a big vision and they have ambitious and grand goals what does it actually mean impact is i mean uh, is basically uh, essentially w- the thing that you're doing is it a needle mover that's basically what it is is that does it move the more needle the thing are you always prioritizing on the most important things all the time and if you are able to do that you are actually focused on the impact now how do you measure that and how do you do that so i think of it as a in my own uh, framework and i i talk to companies about it i also did that internally at facebook is that i think of impact measured in three different ways one is you uh, move a metric if you take a specific metric that you have in mind which is oh, maybe your north star metric and you want to move that that essentially is one way to create impact the second is influence uh, a product decision that could be like you are doing things to identify an opportunity to help set a roadmap or a strategy those would be another way of uh, creating impact and the third was influencing and changing a process which would be like hey it's something that are being done manual and i can now automate it and that would also relate to create impact and i tell i used to tell people at facebook that if you're not doing one of this if something you're doing an activity doesn't come into one of these things you're probably not having impact then what ends up happening is that you confuse motion with progress and so there's a lot of motion you do a lot of different work and you find out that it's not prioritizing on the right thing and so uh, essentially impact is saying you need you shouldn't be confusing motion with progress can you just for those listening who don't know the difference between motion and progress how do you define the difference between motion and progress i'm loving this yeah um, motion is about doing tons of work and i re- recall when i used to be younger i would say i worked 24 hours i didn't sleep three nights in a row and that's just basically saying you did a bunch of different things lots of activity but if you ask those three days of activity what was the impact what is the value of the, uh, the value of that activity and you can't actually say much oh i did 2000 things and i think what ends up happening is that we we i, I think it's a, it's a right of passage i think at a, at a earlier phase of life you actually work hard and you feel good about it and working hard is the most important thing i still think is the most important thing but by the way but if you work hard and don't work on the right things and you don't prioritize it that doesn't lead to impact and so the idea is that the motion is all about activity lots of different activity and the moment you think it's it's kind of like a vanity metric i mean it's like saying i got i mean uh, i i have these billions of installs where i the, the retention is like 1% right it's not something that you really want to it's sort of like a vanity metric i i think uh, that's like a vanity metric in my does opinion does activity not lead to progress though and what i mean by that is by doing lots of things even if you are directionless yeah. you get data that will direct you in certain progressive directions i have a framework for this so if you think about your activity and if you think about it everything feels like a uh, in terms of if you take a completely new activity right you are actually learning up in the in a, in a curve and then you start a flat note right i mean if you look at it you go on a straight line you keep growing as you go along and then after a point of time you 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 asymptote it you don't grow anymore Let's take for example basically this thing brushing your teeth i mean brushing your teeth is now second nature you can't say that if i spend 2 hours on it you're going to get that much better probably not incremental there's opportunity cost to it so as you in terms of activity if every single activity that you do where on the straight line that every single hour that you spend every single day you spend improves or increases or you better each day then i think you should be spending time on all kinds of different types of activity and you'd be okay but i think if you spend 80% of your time actually saying that you're all you're trying to do is you know provide a, a i mean a, basically your t- traffic ticket at the new jersey turnpike and you're handing it out that can't be if 80% of your time is just doing that you can't say i'm getting better and better at it so i think it's a kind of activity to do 
whether you are on the growth curve of the activity or in the or you are in the asymptote of the activity and i think if you maximize that then you're probably in a much better shape mark once said in a q and a in internal to facebook that he said that he and a lot of the reasons why we do that is because of how secure we are as people and he would basically say that something like i don't know the exact number but he said like 80% of his time he is he does activity that's outside his comfort zone which basically means that he's trying to be on this sloping growth curve rather than the flat curve i think most people can't do that because they're not secure enough to do it but if you are able to do that i think you'll have the greatest impact you can in the shortest amount of time and impact also is if you think about the total amount of impact is the impact over time right the total amount of impact you can or oh, oh, divided by the time that you spend I, i totally agree with you and get you can ask when you think about that activity leading to impact how did that drive influence your decision making advice when you think about sequoia because venture is a weird business in the way that it's serendipitous there is some elements of luck that is quite unexplainable i ran into chandra after years and decided to do the deal at how did you think about that when you think about your time with sequoia and driving the data effort there i think at the highest level you know you have so many things in terms of the data team that you are at sequoia that you can actually do for example you could be spending time on on sourcing there are three types of activities that we did basically we i would spend time on sourcing which is trying to identify companies uh, that you that investors can go talk to second is due diligence once the company comes in and they give 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 us the data room we basically need to make a recommendation on whether this company is doing well or not and the third is company portfolio building which is like go entering go to the companies that are trending well and basically try to spend your time and try to see how you can make a good company great and that's the third thing now if you were to spend the time it's again come come back to what how you spend your time if you were to spend the time that is a company that is likely not going to go up and to the right and you spend all your time on that you can imagine how much of impact the company would have the same thing would be true with f- f- the sourcing if you give uh, an investor 200 different leads rather than the top five leads that matter i think it makes a material difference to how it is it's also the d- due diligence eh? in the due diligence I, i think we made a lot of great progress on that is basically coming up with framework so that we can actually make very good decisions on it what we realized on the due diligence part in particular what we realized even through the way we prioritized was that how quickly can we say no and that was primarily what we arrived to because that was the fastest way what is the one signal in every company that would say no rather than say yes talk to me what progress did you make there and how did you come to answer that question of how fast can we say no and focus our attentions more effectively there was a company where we would actually find out that the they were growing really well everything was going right at, to the right and then we would find out uh, we asked them for the marketing spends and we would find the marketing spends the reach of the marketing when we looked at the marketing reach it had uh, it uh, it was very close to the addressable market so basically they already talked to everyone in which case we realize that, that that one thing is not another company we find out that uh, the reason why we did not invest was we realize that there um there are all the older cohorts were doing really really well uh, retaining well uh, and engaging well but we found that the more recent cohorts were actually starting to decline and we could see it in the data and that is the one reason that we did not invest in them so these are just two examples but every time that we would look at we will stress it and saying how can i say no to the company can i ask it's e- i mean i'm a venture investor as well um it's easy to say no you know there's always i don't like the sector i don't like the size of the market at the time whatever reason we give it's harder to say yes and see beauty where others don't do you feel that was the right approach so two things i think if you look at it from a funnel perspective and from the time perspective if you th- think about it if you think about the funnel and saying the investors talk to you know uh let's say 2000 companies in all per year uh on probably it's more but let's say it's 2000 to 5000 companies in all and then you have this bucket of uh, l- let's say there are only 50 great companies in all every year that you can even invest into then you want to catch those 50 and the thing is that if you make wrong investments and many of this by the way that the, that we stopped uh, sequoia from investing where i think they would have otherwise invested it was so close to investment so then you're going to spend so much more company so think about every investor if you have 10 great 10 companies in your portfolio every investor has 10 10 companies in the portfolio if 
Eight of them are not so good and two are great. They spend all the time on that two, but they can't do anything about the eight. They still need to talk to them. If you can make it like out of the 10, you have five good and five bad, you're in so much better place in terms of where you are. So I actually think that it really helps the investors themselves because you do, you do want fewer and fewer bad investors. I actually think that good investments are relatively, I mean, there may be this one great investment that nobody knows about. And those are hard and I agree with that. But if you think about the good investment, very quickly everyone knows about it. It's not that hard for good investments. It's only the bad investment that you may end up investing, I believe, is where most of the most of the opportunity lies. That's so interesting in terms of like actually where you said no being the most valuable, not being to save them the time up front, but it's to save them investing money that would otherwise have been misinvested. And time. And investing time. money and time. Time is a big one for uh, Sequoia because he, each investor, they would rather be spending uh, on five good investments out of eight than two good investments out of 10. What do you think makes Sequoia so good, Chandra, having seen it internally? So first, I think the quality of the fund founders, they're ex- I mean, of the investors themselves are exceptional. I actually think that brand for several, several years. I mean, nobody doesn't talk to them, right? I mean, you have everyone talking to Sequoia, which actually gets them all the leads that they want to. And that, that, that's pretty exceptional. The third is the diversity of the people that are in the group is like you have all the way from, you know, I mean, during those times is Mike Moritz and Jim Getz and, and Ruloff and, and Pat and of course, so many other people. And they have this diversity people with different types of skills. And I think they're collaborative Decision making is also excellent in the way that it's uh, the collaborative decision making. I think the process that they take in terms of how they go through the, you know, the from the one pages, from the time that they actually uh, source the deal to going through uh, the due diligence process to getting to the one pages and, you know, to actually talk about it and then going through the decision making process. I love the way that they do that process. They keep talking about one thing. Everyone going into the room, they talk about this prepared man. I keep talking about it since to my team and so on. It's like people who go into the room, there's already, if you have a Monday morning meeting, they circulate the entire memo on a Friday. And when people go into that room and and make a collective decision, they go with a prepared mind, which basically means you better have read your memo. You come in knowing everything. We're not going to talk to you about the basics. We'll go deep into the investment itself. And I, I actually think it's a it's a, it's, a, it's a phenomenal firm. I totally agree with you. Um, I do want to go back to the core question of like the impact versus activity because I can, I can go off in many tangents, Chandra, so don't worry about that. Was there any other takeaway that you want to highlight from Facebook? I think the second one I would say is the, uh, is the uh, I learned what it meant to build a world-class organization or a world-class team that was happy. And again, this came a lot from uh, from the growth team at Facebook. I, I think both uh, I would attribute Alex Schultz and uh, Harvey to it. They knew they get a very, very high bar. At their first, I think, high bar in terms of the people that they had, the high bar in expectations about them, but and in the way that they cared. So they found a way that we, in terms of, I mean, we talked about impact earlier. I think it's the impact per capita. So the way you think about it is like impact is equal to impact per capita or impact divided by the number of people times the number of people. They always carry out impact per capita. How much can each person do? And then multiply it by the number of people. So as a result, what they would have is uh, the growth marketing team, which uh, which which uh, Alex ran, had Brian Hale, which who was on the show. Uh, and there are so many other people who are on the show. I think Ryan was in the show. So there are multiple people on the show, and this is all Alex. And it was like a seven-people team or a six-people team. And I would think like, how can six or seven or eight people have such enormous output? And it's just a camaraderie, the way he built teams, the way that he would n- make sure that every single person who came in would be incredible and never try to grow very, very fast. And so it is impact per capita. I think what we get confused a lot of time is total impact. This like total impact can be gained by lots of people. How do you calculate impact per capita? If I'm like a founder listening and I'm like, okay, I've got seven people in a marketing team or a growth team. How do I actually do that, Chandra? It's kind of hard, but I would say when I first joined Facebook, and I remember uh, uh, an engineer, Harry, uh, who worked on the payments team, told me once, the way we think about the impact here is basically uh, take our market cap, which I think was $10 billion then. And there were probably, let's say, I'm, I'm the, for the math, for the sake of math, I'm just going to say far, far, 1,000 engineers, I think it was far fewer. But just for math, I'm just saying it's... Uh, is thousand engineers, so that would be like ten million per 
engineer if I'm doing my math right. So essentially he's saying every single engineer contributes 10 million to this. Or I think it was more like 20 or 50 million. But so every so every new engineer that comes in and uh, will have to contribute so much. Otherwise, if you can't find something that they can do that can be of that type of impact, don't hire. And I think it's the same sort of mindset that Alex and Harvey and everyone else had, which is like, do not add more people. One thing, if you add more people, what happens is you, the A plus players becomes A and so on. And, and very fast, you need to get to grow very slowly so you can reach equilibrium very slowly and then keep the value of the entire team high. So do not hire very fast. And so that, that was one thing. I would also say that the way you me- measure it, yes, it's harder in, in many things, but you kind of know in ma- many ways you, you can think about it as like if you basically say, I can only have X number of engineers and then essentially peg your engineers to every other part of the team. So it's 20 to one, let's say engineer to PM ratio or from PM to data scientist, a one to one ratio. So, but essentially if you're saying engineers are building stuff and you have a market cap or some value there, you can actually say what the value of everyone should be. I love that. No, you absolutely can. I, I just think so few people probably approach it in that way. You, you you spoke about Ryan. You spoke about Alex. These are some of the best growth minds that we have. Um, growth is quite a widely used term, Chandra. Um, how do you define growth today? What is it? What's it not also? I just think of growth is, uh, is basically about identifying methods, approaches that scale product market fit in a scalable way. The way you do that is by identifying a North Star metric and moving that metric. And in order to move the metric, you need to basically identify and prioritize the most important opportunities that move the metric. How do you select North Star metric? How do you advise founders on choosing the right one? The North Star metric itself, a lot of, I mean, that, there's a lot of thought that is obviously, uh, a lot of people have uh, multiple thoughts on how do you actually select the North Star metric. I, I, I actually think that for your specific company, there's, there is a mission and it needs to tie to something in your mission. For example, at Facebook, it, at that time that we were there, it was like making the world open and connected. So it naturally was you wanted to get everyone in the world on it. So it just naturally meant that you wanted to get the largest number of people to use a product. So MAU made a ton of sense in terms of what you're trying to do. So that's one way to think about it is like try to get all of that. Can I just understand if we think about like connected world, number of users, is that not an output metric, which is kind of tough for you to work towards them because you really want to work on obviously inputs that lead to outputs. hundred percent. So, uh, In many cases, uh, I'll give the example of, I I actually think that uh, at Facebook, you could actually move the DAU metric too, by multiple ways or DAU, MAU metrics. But for example, if you're trying to move, let's say the number of friends, for example, that could be more of an input metric. So I actually think that the goal itself that you have, the goal that you have uh, needs to be movable and you could move it through multiple, multiple different ways in terms of what you can do. But I actually think that uh, you're not, trying to, uh, if you choose a metric that can't be moved, that's not a good metric. For example, I'll take the example of advertiser growth. In advertiser growth at Facebook, uh, in the advertisers, we decided not to move the revenue metric, but decided to move the advertiser growth metric because that's a metric that we actually could tangibly move. But as we didn't have the levers to move the revenue metric. But I, I do believe from an active user perspective, or DAU or MAU perspective, we actually could move the metric in terms of what those, uh, I mean, in terms of what those metrics were. How often do you change your North Star metric, Chandra? I think a lot of your North Star metrics changes. Uh, you change it largely because, I mean, for example, when Instagram came along uh, to Facebook, we still had the MAU as our goal. And so when we had the MAU as a goal, I mean, uh, basically Kevin's system was like, what? We're now in the mobile world. People use the phones all the time. We should be doing, uh, we do DAUs. We don't do MAUs. It makes sense because essentially people are using the product every single day. Why are you still caught up in the MAU? And that made us start a thing because we were still in the web world, which is fine, where people weren't using the product every day. So in that sense, as the company starts transitioning, let's say from a web world to a mobile world, you need to change. And that is one reason why you would actually change your metric is like move from a MAU goaling metric to a, a DAU kind of a goaling metric. That, that's just an example, but I, I, I think the market is one reason. The second reason is actually uh, the world changing on you itself. 
and and uh, and and so on. And third, I mean, you may have just picked a bad metric. Sometimes in companies, it's just hard. It takes a lot of iteration to get to the right metric. Do you think pattern recognition and playbooks are good? Or do you think they're misleading? When we look at a pre-AI world versus a post-AI world, a pre-COVID versus a post-COVID, the world changes so much. I know, man. I know. I know. I think the 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 problem, as you point out, the biggest problem for anything with with your intuition led is bias. It's bias and how the world will change around you. And you those are the ones that you need to guard against. But honestly, that's the best you got at that point. So if you actually have to make a decision, and I actually think that the cost of not making the decision, in my opinion, is far worse than making a wrong one, as long as you can iterate fast. But you're right, you're not going to get it. The intuition is not fail-safe, for sure. But even data is not fail-safe. Data also works under certain assumptions that you have. And those assumptions can just get ripped off. It can change. Yeah. Oh, they can. And also, yeah, I mean, data can be misleading in many respects too. Um, I, I do have to ask, I spoke to Julie on your team before, and she told me that I had to ask kind of while we're still in the formulation stage of strategy, there's North Star, but there's also hypothesis. And you said, never forget the hypothesis in your approach. So how do you define really what is a good hypothesis? And do you always need one? Any problem that you're trying to solve, um, you do, if you want to deeply understand, if you want to make great decisions, you need to understand a phenomena very deeply. That, that's my thesis. If you want to understand, if you want to make a great decision, you need to understand that phenomena that you're trying to make a decision very well. If you want to understand that, you basically need to uh, analyze that problem very well and, and, uh, and using data to, to come up with that. In order for you to construct the story around the phenomena, it turns out the data has a lot of things. I think of data as a manifestation of you have a story that you care about and then it's manifested in the data that you have. So the data itself is manifested in a ton of different metrics, for example. And you understand and say, okay, active users went up or new users went up or you find that ad spend went up and so on and so forth. And what ends up happening is that you need to come up with a bunch of hypotheses of why they went up or down. And generally these types of hypotheses, for example, if you look at active users going up or something, the primarily the reasons are either, either it's seasonality or it's a product change, or it's a sales change, or, the, or there's a marketing change, or a competition, or things like that. Or, or, and it's manifested as behavioral change in customers, and that's how it is manifested. And then, ultimately, you see it in the data. So to me, if you, do, if you want to deeply understand a phenomena and make great decisions, you need to understand the story behind it really well. If you want to understand the story behind it very well, you have to go into metrics and see how they changed, identify them, and then be able to come up with the right hypothesis of why they changed. And then if you do that, you can make great decisions. I don't know if you know Annie, Ju Annie Duke, but she is a writer and a poker player who wrote a book called Thinking in Bets, which basically talks about kind of decision making. And she has uh, talks about this theory, and I can't remember what it's called, but it's essentially when good process leads to not successful outcome or when successful process leads to bad outcome. Uh, how do you think about that? And does that go against the importance of hypothesis? In terms of how you do the hypothesis, you need to stress test it, which means you come up with hypothesis and then you need to look at data to validate the hypothesis. So you just can't do a hypothesis and say, this is it and so on. So the way that you, you do this and I'll tell you a quick example that we did, for example, at, 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 at PayPal in fraud. For example, the way we would do that, we found out that, for example, there are a bunch of different, uh, I mean, we wanted to reduce fraud, which is the most important metric for uh, the risk management and probably the most important for even PayPal in terms of the metric that they cared about, one of the most important metrics that they cared about. So what we did was we said, okay, uh, we made a hypothesis and we basically said, hey, people, if they use the same cookie, uh, which is a web cookie, and if they, if more than five people use the same cookie on the same day, there's something wrong with it. Which basically we are saying that people were using a single computer, they were taking other people, taking over other people's accounts, and doing a bunch of different activity on it, and then there is something bad about it. So we basically start with the hypothesis and saying, hey, this is wrong. So we go, to, so then you go into the data and try to validate it, and saying, okay, is it really true? And when you go into the data, you say, yeah. Many of them actually fraud. So you look at good use cases and a bad use case. The, the bad use cases are 
Yeah, they, many of them are fraudsters. Then you look at the good use case. For the same person who's using the same computer, it turned out that a bunch of them were family members. And that's something you can actually find out through deeper investigations. Or they were using an internet cafe. They were the same people using the same internet cafe, logging in out of the product. So what you end up doing is that you need to go back from data to hypothesis and back to data and basically solve the problem that way. And so if you actually do that and you're rigorous about it, and you really want to tell the story, and you want to make sure that the, the story is right, you need to get that. Now, there may be still things that you don't know that you don't know, and your story still may be wrong, but you still want to get to the point of getting from data to hypothesis and back, and then be able to tell what the story around it, and then hypothesis what story it is. If you can do that, you can make great decisions. Is it always obvious being able to tie data to hypothesis? Like, Where does the challenge come in that? transition between the two? There are multiple problems here. One is, I think when you have the data, um, it is possible, when I mean, you have a hypothesis, you can't even check it. For example, at Facebook, we would have saying that, hey, by the way, we would, uh, we would want to know why advertisers are churning. And there's no easy way to find it. I mean, you actually need to do a survey. It takes a long time. And then they would basically say ROI. When they say ROI, we still won't understand what ROI meant to them because we don't actually know the data behind it. So a lot of this Time, I mean, there are things that you can actually find out through the product. And so it's already in the product and it's in the data and you can actually provide the type of hypothesis to validate the hypothesis many, many times. You can't do it through just data. You need to do it through essentially user experience research and, and so on. So there is a, a problem of just being able to validate your hypothesis because typically speaking, a, a lot of times you don't have the data. The flip side is also true. You may not even be able to come up with the right hypothesis. And I've seen that happen too. It's like you don't know what went on and suddenly you realize uh, what happened. For example, what happened at uh, Facebook and it happened, we came up with a hypothesis very, very much, much later. It's like we found that there's certain parts of America which had a, uh, a, an increase in time spent and we didn't know what happened. And we kept looking and said, what is all this? And we kept digging deep and it ended up being winter. Very cold winters, people stay in at home and they use the product a lot more. And the time spent went up. And if you look at just time spent across US on extremely cold days, you see an increase in time spent, not. You mentioned that kind of incredible team members uh, helping contribute to the decision making and the discovery. I spoke to so many people around you, Chandra, and they said that one of your great skills is in building teams and in inspiring and encouraging great talent to be its best. I do want to touch on this. And we mentioned a lot there in terms of operations and the granularity of it. When's the right time, do you think, to add a first growth hire? When you're advising companies and founders today, how do you advise them? You don't want to hire anyone before product market fit. Because at the end of it, I think, as I mentioned to you, I think growth is about scaling that product market fit in a sustainable way. It basically means that if you're not able to grow, if, you, if you're not even reached the point where you can actually scale it, no point getting your first hire. I was just with a, a billion dollar founder the other day. And they said, to me, product market fit is when literally monkeys could run the business and people want it so much that they would still sell really big product volumes. <laughs> what would it be to you? Other people are like, oh, you're 10 first customers. There's many different variants and they're not right. It's just different. What's your like, ah, oh, they have it or they don't? I have now, because I worked, especially being at Sequoia and worked with enterprise and e-commerce and small companies and large companies and all kinds of different companies, I don't have a single answer for this, it's a single simple answer that will satisfy everyone. But I would basically say it's essentially, uh, if it's a consumer product, people want to come back. They want to keep using the product. They seem to love the product. And you're not throwing more money at it, which means that's why I mean by sustainable. It's not like you're throwing huge amount of marketing dollars to just keep them uh, on and there is some they are actually give, being able to provide uh, a value that other companies don't. Uh, and I think with the product market fit, it doesn't mean the product market fit you can actually scale it because the moment you start charging, for example, it's a free product and maybe just the people are only using it because of the free product. The moment you charge it and charge the same amount as a competitor, it may just go away. So it's not that it's guaranteed that you're going to go from, I mean, product market fit, scaling product market fit. Unit economics, scaling unit economics. I think those are all four different steps in my opinion. So I actually think that it is, uh, you can get to product market fit, but you may not be able to scale it for several reasons. And if you get to 
scaling product market fit, you may not get to unit economics. And if you do we get to unit economics, you'll never be able to scale it. I, listen, I completely agree with you. I think product market fit has many chapters. You, you've worked with many SaaS companies. You start in PLG, you scale into mid-market, you move into enterprise. At each tangent, you need to regain product market fit in each customer segment. So I couldn't be more aligned to you. What a terrible question, Chandra. I mean, God, I apologize. Uh, <laughs> listen, so we have that realization that it's post product market fit. Okay. I'm a founder. You're an investor in my business and you're advising me. What's the right profile for that first growth hire? I'm not sure if you just hire one single person is going to be that valuable to you. Meaning that what will that one single person do? And it probably is a team that you need to hire. Uh, and if you think about the one single person that you're trying to hire, if you were thinking about the one single person you're trying to hire is probably the leader of the team who can then get you everyone else, such as getting you the, I mean, as you know, I mean, you need to get the designer and the growth marketing person and the analytics person, the product manager, right? And uh, engineer, all of them on board. So if you don't have that, I'm not sure how you can actually actually uh, function because you can have someone, they won't have, and of course, the marketing spends the dollars too for it. And uh, so if you don't have that, I don't know how, what they would do if you had just one person. But I would basically say that you need to hire, if you had to hire only one person, it'd probably be someone who is relatively senior who can hire everyone else or be part of the team and so that you can actually get a team that can actually work and, and move a metric. Okay, so it's really interesting. Your answer that jumps straight to a growth team being independent, a standalone growth team. The alternative could be that you have designers, you have marketers with a growth slant towards them, more analytical, more rigorous in that way. Um, you have PMs in the similar vein, and they work as an integrated part of the existing org. Do you think growth teams need to stand independently? Or do you think they can function within the org? I think there are uh, two answers to this. I think the answer at an earlier stage of your growth, I think they should be a standalone team. I think it's for two reasons. One is I think it's the is for the best practices, meaning that they can learn from each other and then they can go solve problems across the company. Suddenly you separate this team and put them into the different paths. I don't know if they'll be able to build the same culture of the know-how. A lot of it is knowing how to do this really, really well. And all of this transfer, if you went from, let's say, I, I worked on many parts of this, from pages growth to games growth to advertiser growth to, you know, and then when you have all of these types of growth, what ends up happening is that these sort of knowledge does translate. And imagine that you, all this was not part of one single team and they were separated all over. I actually think, don't think the learnings will be there. So my feeling at the earlier stage, you should all, I mean, it should be centralized. Now, once you get a large enough team, if you get to a large enough team, I actually think that it can start to be decentralized and work, go into product teams. But I actually think that early on, it should be centralized. So the more important thing is that somewhere in the interim, you probably have a, a role where you embed people into teams. You embed people into team, but you still have a centralized organization. And then at some point, you move completely decentralized. My question to you there was, that's wonderful, but it almost feels inverted when you look at the budget of a scaling company. You know, this centralized standalone is when you have the least money. And then when you're scaled and you do have the money that you could afford that centralized, you, 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 do you see what I mean? So is it possible to do that early? And how do you think about the need for that centralized team with the budget of a, a, a young company that has maybe just hit Series A? Yeah, at the end of it, to think about it, you're at a series A. I mean, are you going to do 20 things? Are you going to do two things, three things, four things for the front of the growth team? So there are fewer things that you're actually going to do. And for that, a small team will just suffice. You're doing very, very few things. And for that, those five people that I talked about just do. And you'll work on one and you'll work on the second and you'll work on the third. And you'll actually work on multiple types of problems. At any time, you probably don't work on more than two or three because the surface area can't be that large. If you're going to spend that much time on everything, you're probably going to do nothing right. So I think at a smaller phase of your company, you don't need, it's the surface area narrows so you can actually do it with just a centralized team. But actually when the surface area grows, you can actually start to spread your wings out. So I actually think it works out. That's really interesting to hear in terms of that transition from centralized to decentralized. Founders are always told, hey, you need to hire for 18 months ahead of time uh, for the future company that you will be. Do you agree with that, given the many different hiring experiences and scaling journeys you've seen? This comes back to the product growth, right? 
I think that if you think about it from a, I mean, I have, while at Facebook, uh, so this, I'll give you an example. At Facebook, uh, when I joined Facebook, uh, analytics was all about counting numbers. And then it was creating dashboards. And then it was doing A-B testing. And then it was going towards goals, roadmap, and strategy. So initially, the types of person that we needed to hire were basically people who can just count numbers. And secondly, so it was a bunch of people who can create infra to create dashboards. The third was people who actually were statisticians who could do A-B testing. And then finally, it was people who could influence. And even now, I think it's Facebook is like uh, the analytics team is largely about influence, even inside the growth team and so on. Throughout, it's about influence. So the point is that if I had actually hired three years earlier and said, I'm going to hire people for influence, what would have ended up happening was people wouldn't have been able to do the same people who do the A-B testing who need stats background are not the ones who can actually influence. And what would have happened is that you wouldn't have actually taken the journey in the right way. So what ended up happening was that we, we built our dashboards, we automated it. A-B testing, we built something called Delta, it automated it. And then when we could automate all of this stuff, it became easier for us to move towards what we think was the most valuable thing that analytics teams could do is influence. So again, we would, even on the growth team, we would actually understand, identify opportunities, influence the roadmap of products, of what of the roadmap of what we need to build. So my point is that I think it depends on the growth of your company and where you are at. I think there are the, at a later stage, I started to build for much, much longer, 18 months and so on. But the earlier stages, I actually hired for what I needed right now because there's no point in hiring someone who will be so valuable for you in 18 months and who can influence everything but can't build your dashboard. But I, I think when I actually um, advise a bunch of different companies now, it depends. I, I change my answer based on who I'm talking to. If I think this company is in a rocket ship, for example, a company like OpenAI, I would be like, in fact, I did that. And when I talked to OpenAI, they asked me who should be hiring for the head of analytics and head of growth and so on. I said, oh, someone who's look, looking at a rocket ship, don't worry whether they are statisticians or there is influence is the most important thing for them. But if I were to be at an early stage Series A company, I would say hire for someone now because I don't know how you're, uh, it's just as an early part of your product market fit. If you reach certain levels of scale, I think it's a very different thing. So I think it's a lot to do with the stage at which you are at. And I think your answer is either very short term or long term. But keep in mind that it's going to become long term. If the company goes into a rocket ship, you do need to hire for the long term. I'm fascinated. You mentioned the word influence there. And I, obviously, I spoke to Alex before the show. And he mentioned that you did face some uh, pushback against some of the data that you presented at Facebook and some of the ideas that you kind of outlined. Why do you think that was the case? Just help me understand that. I think influence is a hard problem. So I think uh, influence is obviously an art, not a science. And so um, if people are very receptive about what you're going to say, it's very, very, it's actually very easy. So people who are very data informed, who actually want to lead to to uh, to embrace data, actually, it's, it's actually very easy for you to do it. So uh, I, there's also what and how there, which means like, uh, what do you want to say and how you say it? And so if you actually are not doing that very well, so one thing is like, I may just not do a good job of influencing. So once, say, if you have the right data and being able to write and be able to influence, I think there are multiple reasons. One is the the person that, that you're talking to. If they're not receptive, it's very hard for you to influence. Second, if you're not doing a good job, you may not be able to influence. Third is that you the answer may be right, but if you don't have the right data to convince people, you may not be able to. And the fourth, I think, is just um, biases all around. I think if people have strong biases about what they want to see and don't want to see, I think it's very hard. So for me, I think in particular, uh, I uh, in my earlier Earlier time I had Facebook, I think I struggled with influence largely because of the fact that I, I actually think that there was um, there were specific leaders, and this is probably what Alex is talking about, where who were not receptive to what I was saying, and as a result, uh, it became very hard for me to influence them, and it might have uh, it both hurt me and I think the company a bit. Has the way that you influence changed over time? Often say when you're younger, you may take a more dogmatic binary approach with passion and Chandra, you've got to. And over 
has, has your approach changed? Yeah, it's patent recognition, uh, Harry. I, I actually think that over a period of time, you do so much of it because that's all I practiced. At Facebook, if you think about uh, what I did the most was influence over a period of time. And then you have so many different characters and each of them just becomes a cast of characters and you start to understand what ticks with them, what does not. And once you do that, there is a way of approaching influence. So I actually think it's uh, I, 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 it's an art. You have an idea and say, oh, this type of person, they can be influenced through data. You need to be really good at storytelling. For example, Harvey, you go to try to influence Harvey, you just throw the data. Don't give me anything other than just data. Just tell me the data. Don't tell me the story. You go to Chris Cox. Don't just throw data at me. Tell me the story, please. So there is... These types of, and the, both are extremely well-meaning, but there are multiple different spectrum of people that you work with and you have to understand who they are. I also found that while I worked at Sequoia, I think I found four different types of founders, people who love data and knew data and wanted to embrace. That's one. There are people who love data, thought they knew a lot, but would not listen to you because they thought they knew more than you. And then there was a third who did not know data, but said, there is something out there, come help me. And that was fine too. And there are people like, this is crazy. This is so stupid. I don't believe in data. It's all should be designed. This is crazy. So you have all of these types of founders and some of them, you just can't. The people who are like, I'm going to be closed, have a wall in front of me. You just can't influence. There's no way to influence. But the people who are like, I don't know much, but I am hungry. You can. The people that are, uh, that are, the no data, but they say, I want to know more because I want to learn from people around me. Those you can. The people who are adamant and saying, I know more than you. Very difficult. And I've had all these four. So you got to judge that of who are you talking to? And then, then how you tell the story? You tell a story, do you just show data? How much of data do you show? Do you go deep into storytelling and tell them every small thing or just peel layer after layer after layer? And you need to learn that while you're talking to them. And then on the fly, be ready to influence. And that's a very hard thing. What are the biggest mistakes people make when trying to influence people, have you found? The biggest one I used to make and I think most people make is the is uh, is confusing the what and the how. It's like, what message do you want to deliver and how do you deliver the message? And so when you deliver the message, we are all human beings. If you can do it in a way that is easier for that person to handle, I think, or they it can resonate with them, uh, or all the influencing skills I talked to you about. Then I think it makes your job much more easier. I've seen many, many people try the influence, but they they fail. I mean, for example, I knew uh, a very senior leader at at Facebook who would be like, "I'm just," they'd be so blunt and say, "This is it, take it or leave it," or and it would never resonate because they didn't try hard to influence. They just wanted to say the facts, but they didn't try to say, is that person actually, I mean, at the end of it, influence is not about just saying, it's about having the impact, making sure you're able to influence into making a change in the direction that you think should be the right way to do it. It's not just about saying things, it's actually making the change. For that, you need to go far more than just saying things in any way you want. So you got to start to understand people and psychologies and all these things. I said to someone the other day, you know, no, I'm very direct and clear in communication. They said, that doesn't matter. It's not what you say, it's how it's heard. Exactly. And I was like, huh, that's a very annoying answer. (laughs) 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 Um, But I totally agree with you. And I love that separation between the what and the how. I do want to touch on the hiring process. You've hired many incredible teams. I spoke to Alex about your hiring process and the incredible people you've brought. How do you think about the hiring process for how you add great people to teams? I think very dimensionally, which basically means that I don't think about a person as a person. I think of them as a body of skills. So what that basically means that are they peaking in one or two or three different things and not a liability in the others? That's kind of how I think about every person. So the point is that, so if that's what it is, I would think like, say, oh, this person is exceptional in ABC, they can bring a lot to the table. At the end of it, what you're trying to do is hire a bunch of different people who are excellent what they do, that they can learn from each other and become better EJ. So what you're really trying to assemble overall is if you think about why anyone comes to work, it's for four, four different reasons. One is they love what they do. Number two, they love 
the people they work with. Number three, they feel like they can learn from the people that they work with. And four, the company is going up and to the right. If one of these four does not work, they will leave. So that's what you're trying to do. So essentially what you mean is if you have the people with the same skills, all of them being exactly the same skills, they're not going to learn from each other. If you're going to have people that you feel like you don't love working with and they're all jerks, how are you going to stay? If the company is not doing very well, it's actually a, a company that was great 50 years back and doing nothing now, are you going to stay? No, the company's got to go up and to the right. Finally, do you love what you do? You come in to do something. You came to do design or you came to do growth marketing or you came to do analysis or you do something. Do you actually enjoy your job? And if all four of them fit, you do a great job. I mean, you love it. So essentially what it happens is when you are trying to hire... I mean this in the nicest way. Do you actually believe that? Though? I mean, that's why Morgan Stanley and Goldman Sachs exist. They do not love what they do in a lot of cases. They do not love the people. They think their boss is an asshole. Uh... But they get a massive comp package and the year-end bonus is 200% base and they live a nice, sal- life, nice life in New York or London or wherever and they stay for years. I've got many friends who are gr- like great talents and they're at shit companies, but they love their team. I agree with you that there are reasons why people may stay, but you ask me for the kind of person that I want to hire and what I want to have in a team and what... What really makes them come every day? The thing about the Morgan Stanley guy who you're talking about, they're probably working out of fear or they're working because of some boss. If you ask the same question of is, are you getting the best out of that person, him or her? I don't think you are. It's hard for me to think over a long period of time. Maybe over a week or two, you can. But over a period of a year, I don't think you're going to get the best out of the person. So if you want to get to the best out of the person, they really need to enjoy what they do. It's about making sure that they come in. They're not, they don't come to work with fear. They come with with loving what they do and building up a bottom of culture that they can be happy and wonderful at. You said about kind of the body of skills that you want to really see them spike on. When you think about kind of growth teams and analytics teams in particular, are the, is that body of skills a finite, small, limited number which you want to see? Or is it largely in, large and expansive? I think there are a few things. Uh, one is, I think, uh, from an analytical perspective, um, uh, I, I'll talk about the body of skills and then I'll talk about the outcomes. Uh, the body of the skills would be like, are they able to break a problem down? That becomes an important thing, which basically uh, is like, if, they, if, you t- if you give them a complex problem, are they able to simplify it and make it essentially convert into a, uh, a, a business question into a technical question? And then from the technical question, can they convert into a data question? And then from a data question, are they able to do the right type of analysis? And then from the analysis, can they derive the right type of insights? And then from those insights, can they convert into the actionable insights? From the actionable insights, can you convert it to opportunities and decisions? So there's a mindset of how, and the first few skills that you have is breaking it down is more like a consulting skill. It's like a mindset that you need to have. The second skill is a technical skill, which requires some amount of coding, etc. The third is analysis skill. And the fourth is basically a, a lot of it to, ha, has to do with um, uh, with the fact that you, you I mean, in, in terms of synthesis skills and influencing skills that you need to have. And if you did all that, you can actually do what you can actually uh, do what you can do great at, at, uh, at uh, in terms of analyzing a funnel or analyzing retention or analyzing any sort of problem that you want and identify opportunities, set roadmaps with it, and trying to uh, move move the thing forward. I would also say that in terms of analytics itself, there are literally only two things you need to do. One is indexing, which is you want to see if things are under-indexed or over-indexed in anything. You're comparing and benchmarking. And the second thing is asking the so what question. The only two things. Under index, I mean, so for example, uh, over indexing and under indexing means that if you have a certain, uh, if New York is going up, you're asking if Chicago also is going up. You need to benchmark to something. And if, if New York is going much more up, it's over indexed. And so then you want to provide there's an opportunity of some kind. I'm just simplifying it. And then if New York went up by 0.001%, is it material? And that's the so what question. And that helps you prioritize. So essentially, analytics, literally, you need to know only how to index and how to how to ask this for what question. If you do that really well, 
that's really the two skills that you need. But in order for you to even get that, you need technical skills. You need all the other kinds of skills because you need to munch data. And then being able to tell the story, put it together and influence, right? That's the other part that he said. You can actually do the so what, do that. But if you don't know how to influence it, it's a problem. That's a slightly different dimension. The influencing is a different dimension. Technical is, technical is a different dimension. But the analysis itself, the core to it, it's basically really two things. Can I ask you, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm very naive and ignorant, so forgive me for my stupid questions, but on the indexing side, does that not just relate everything to the average, as we said there, the index? And we want to be exceptional. Think about LPs and funds. The index in venture is shit. We want to be in the top decile, which is, you name your fund. Let me give you an example, right? I, I worked with MongoDB while I was Sequoia. Yeah. So at Mongo, what we basically did was we had a, uh, we basically were looking at the pay payment conversion rates. And uh, I went in there and they had a data science team and they had an analytics team and they had worked on it for, for I don't know how long, but I went in there, to, took a quick look and found out that Germany had a very low conversion rates compared to its neighbors like France or, or uh, the rest of Western Europe. It had a far lower payment conversion rate. And I was like, it shouldn't be. It should be similar to the other European countries. Why is it so low? And that's the benchmark. It doesn't have to be the average. It has to be what you think is a similar country or similar something. And so in this case, it turned out that Germany is very different. In that it's, it's a very bank country. It's an ACH country. So they use banks a lot, whereas the rest of the country use credit cards a lot. And it turned out that MongoDB did not have a way for people to pay using a financial instruments using banks. They only had a credit card. So people would go, try, look at the bank. There was no bank uh, bank available. So they would just not convert. And so what I did was I told them, hey, guys, go and, and uh, change that. And I did materially change the top line of, of the companies uh, in terms of what it was. I think, I think they told me, I don't know whether it's true, but it's a, it's a few percentage increase, overall the increase or in, terms of, in terms of conversion because... Germany was a big country and it was converting at abysmally low rates. What does it take to do so what well? Like, What does a good so what lead to? The so what is all asking the question of, okay, this thing increased by 0.1% or 0.5% or 1%. So what? That's all he's asking. And if you ask the so what question, you are basically saying, so what? Yes. Oh, if I do that, it'll increase my wow, my not star metric or Mao, my North Star metric by 100,000 users, or by 200 users. So if it's 200 users, you see, like, duh, it's no value to me. But if it's 100,000 users, wow, that's super cool. That's what I want to move. So when you look at the so what, you have to have a sense of something is material or not. And material basically means you have to have a sense of what your overall goal is. If you have an overall goal, is this the highest opportunity you can have or one of the high opportunities that you can. So you've got to tie whatever you're trying to do back to something into a North Star metric. Even if it's not, this goes to the art and science part, even if it's not an exact, you should have a sense of how much you're going to drive. Without asking the so what question, that's a problem. And what I've realized was the difference between good analytical people and the who can be good at insights, but the ones that can that are good at actionable insight, the muscle is really the so what question. It's not the analysis. They can be great at coming up with lots of indexing and analysis, but coming out, they don't ask so what questions enough. And that's what I've seen differentiate very, very good analytical leaders and not, and who can take basically data into action better because they can, they know how to go from insights to actionable insights. I think it's very similar to like growth investing though, actually, in the difference between a junior and a senior, which is someone who can, you know, just look at data in isolation and that's fine versus one who ties it to a core decision because of the data that they've seen. That's the difference. So I totally agree. Are there questions in the interview process that you will most frequently revert to, to understand their abilities, their spikes? their skills, as you describe them, a body of skills. The more, more and more senior you get, the number one and probably the only thing I care about is their ability to simplify. And uh, I remember Chris Cox once told me that I asked him, what is, the, what is the one single thing that senior people can do? He said, simplify. That's the same thing I have. Is like, can you actually simplify? When you look at a very senior person, I look at it from if they can simplify. Simplify shows clarity of thought. Clarity of thought shows your first principles thinking. 
So if you have great first principle thinking, you have higher degrees of clarity of thought, which leads to simplification. And so the more senior you are, the kind of skills that I look for is can you actually simplify, which basically means that you can take very complex problems, break it down, and you can actually take on harder and harder problems because you're thinking first principles. How do you test if someone's a good simplifier? So what I do is I actually have a blog. I have a blog that I've written. I I don't know whether you guys have come across it, but I saw it in the prep. Yeah. Okay, I, I, I wrote a series of blogs while I was at Sequoia. And when I did that series of blogs, I wrote one on on um, on sustainable growth. And on the sustainable growth, I have them read it. I send them and say, go read it. And there are things in there which is not quite right. There are things in there that make sense. And I basically, first question I generally ask them is synthesize. Just tell me what are the primary takeaways. So those are the kinds of things. So I go through every single thing. And it's not just that I go deep into retention. I go deep into growth itself. I ask them uh, things like you ask me. It's like, what is product market fit? And uh, I see how they think. I can have a dialogue with them. Because it's when you are interviewing for these people, I mean, I know what's on their resume. I mean, it tells you me a bunch of different things about their resume. Like, oh, they can code or they can do this or they can do that. I mean, that's sure. That's I just take that for granted. On top of that, I'm trying to think, in a working environment, when I'm talking to you, when I'm discussing with you, can I actually have a conversation with you? And then in the moment, can you think deeply? And that's what I'm trying to look for. It's funny. I say the best interviewers are able to have a very defined schedule, but in real time, move with conversation flows to make yes. it a very natural conversation. And then you have to bring it back. That's very hard. But it's to your point there about like real time conversation and being able yeah. to move with it. Exactly. And that's what I do. I tell them also up front in the interview, I tell them, look, no answer is wrong, wrong answer. Huh. I only care about how you think. If you are on the wrong track, I'll immediately tell you because some of them are objective. So I say, I'll immediately tell you what it is, but I won't judge you on it. It's fine. I, all I want to do is that I, I want you to have, if you're giving, giving me 10, idea, 10 ideas and eight of them are good and two, two are absurd, I won't judge you on it because inside a great company, those two will be weeded out anyway, but I don't want those eight not to be there. So say whatever you want. Hmm. One of the biggest hiring mistakes you've made. Early on, the big mistakes that I, I used to make, and I make less of it now, I think I probably still make them, is um, I think about slope and asymptote. Asymptote is how good are you? Slope is how fast are you growing? And so what I would hire more for is people with asymptote, which basically means that, oh, they have such a good profile, etc. They've done so much, etc. But they wouldn't look at the growth and they may actually flatten out on the growth part. And that is probably much of my mistakes. You go back to it. One big one would be the hiring for asymptote rather than slope. Now I don't mind. You can imagine what it's just a matter of catch up, right? People with a slower asymptote or the faster growth yeah, is are going to overtake. And I generally tend to invest in people over a very long period of time. But within reason, within two people, within slope and this, I know that basically the the effect of compounding will just overtake the person. And if you're willing to invest over time, you could. I, I totally agree with you. Do you think people are destined for a certain stage of a company's life cycle? You've seen many different stages. And I'm just thinking about the slope, plateauing. Do you, are certain people destined for certain stages? If you're below a certain age, you do, you're do. you not institutionalized. Let's say you're below 27, 30, whatever those ages are, you're probably not institutionalized. Un, until that, I think it's very easy to mold anyone. But beyond a certain age, I think it's so much harder. If you are actually in a certain type of company, you're set in your ways, you have certain ways of thinking, it's that much harder for you to change. I don't think... It's impossible. That's not hard. But I would say that if you have developed the growth mindset very early on, which means that even if you're 31, 35, and you've developed a growth mindset very early on, and your mind is nimble and flexible, you can take on almost anything. It's like, how early did you get on your, did you develop a growth mindset? And if you did, I think you can continue to challenge yourself on anything. But if you didn't, I think you need to cast them young. What was the last thing you challenged yourself on? I think if you look at my career, I am an oceanographer by training. And then I went, did, I did, I went to, I, I was a professor and went into high performance computing. And then I did weather forecasting. Then I went to climate change. I was a, is in risk management at Facebook. Then I moved to analytics at Facebook and led many of the teams there. Went to venture capital and did a bunch of different things. And now I'm doing a startup. So 
I think my journey has been one which has always been like trying to disrupt myself, to be honest with you. And I think the uh, the biggest challenge now I have is uh, is uh, essentially, I, I think two things. One is growing the company itself. And I think growing a remote team in India. And uh, the growing, the remote team in India had its own challenges, uh, partly because of cultural reasons of India. And uh, the and the fact that I think uh, not being able to role model uh, easily because we were in the US and they were in India, the rest of the team was in India. And so I think that has been a, uh, that has been a challenge in itself and do so you, on. Do but you I find think... it tough because at Facebook, you are inundated with data. You know, you put something live and there's 100 million people on it if you want to by the end of the day. With with any new product, it's like you fight and claw for every new customer. Is that tough to transition to? Yeah, so I think what I've started to develop while at Facebook was creating frameworks to think. What it is basically when you start to develop frameworks like a formula as a framework, right? And at Facebook, we used to de- develop from a formula as like you have a formula for the entire company, which is if you look at revenue as the driving metric that you care about, you have number of users and then you have time spent per user and then you have ads per time spent is formula. So those are ways actually to think in terms of frameworks. So if you think about things in frameworks, you don't need that much of data. What you really need to think about is in, in terms of that, and which is why when I went to Sequoia, there's so little data. Compared to Facebook, there's so little data. And then I needed to kind of think about abstractions. How do you create abstractions and frameworks? So then what we realized what all the companies at Sequoia, for example, we can classify for the types of companies phase Sequoia had was eight different types of companies. E-commerce, two-sided marketplaces, uh, you know, consumer subscription, consumer ads, and 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 and, and uh, SaaS, obviously, and so on. So there are these seven or eight different types of companies, eight formulas. And then what tends to happen is that then you don't need to have a lot of data. You All you really need to do have is a way of thinking. And for that, you need to have a way of thinking from first principles. And if you can do that really well, you don't need a huge amount of data. I always have believed every large data problem can be can actually be brought down to a small data problem. Every large data problem can be brought down to a small... I'm being extreme here. Obviously, nothing in Gen AI is like that. But um, in terms of analytics, I think it's actually true. It's like most large data problem can be reduced to small data problems. And then you're solving small data problems. So uh, essentially, if you think of it that way, you don't need large data to solve problems. You need the right data for solving the right problem and you need to tease it out. That's the art. I love that how this conversation goes. Uh, can I ask you, going back to the actual talent, how, how fast do you know when you've made a mishire? Again, you've hired so many people. Three things I look for. One is I think you look at skill gap knowledge gap and values slash culture gap. Those are the three things I expect. If somebody is not doing well, performance not doing well, because somebody is not performing, that can be easily found out. More easily found out if someone is not performing in terms of uh, how they are delivering, you can found out. But not all people who are not performing uh, will do badly. It may be that they're in the wrong role or it may just be that they're deep thinkers. I've seen that too. Or they may just not be good at what they're trying to do and so on. So for that, you need to analyze three things. One is, is the problem that they're trying to do is a skill problem. This is, they don't have, they, they're great at Python, but this is a C++ problem. They can't do it. Okay, that's why they're slowing down. Second is like knowledge problem. It's a Python problem. They know Python really well, but this space is security and they don't understand security, so they can't do it really well. Values is like, are they not working hard or any other cultural things that may be? You have to first identify what the problem is. And as soon as you identify it, if you think it is fixable, then you need to put them on the right track and see what happens. So I think identifying whether or not they're performing is an easier problem, which you can actually do, talk to people, and not just talk to people, just look at the productivity and see what's going on. But to diagnose what the reason is, is is the one that you need to go after. And I've done often, many, many times, I've found that the reason why they're not doing well is because they're not in the right, they're not on the right team or not in the right role or in the right thing. And you just need to shift them and then suddenly they become a force multiplier. That's so interesting. I, I interviewed someone the other day, I, I found it, I can't remember who, I think it was Brian at, at um, HubSpot. And he said that when you put someone on like an improvement plan, it never works. Just get rid. Do you agree? I think when you put a, someone on a performance plan, it's three months too late. It's mm-hmm. uh, three months before you should have intervened and tried to do the right thing. What happens most of the times is that people put them on the improvement plan when 
they've already decided there's no chance of success. And that is why it doesn't work. If you think there's a 20 percent, if if you think there's a 70 percent chance of there or 60 percent chance of them succeeding and you put them on a performance plan, then it might work. But what ends up happening is that we time it so badly. We time it at 10% or 5% or not even 1%. And I think it's the timing which is a problem. And most managers take too late to intervene. And so, and they're not willing to have honest, direct conversations. And because they don't have direct conversations, it becomes that much harder. Largely because most of us are conflict averse and we won't have those conversations. And it becomes too late. And then what do you do? Try to go into a performance plan. I think it's less about the performance plan is when you time it. But regardless, I don't think you need to call it that. Just why do you call it? The label is not great anyway. Just go help them out. If you can't help them out, make sure that you they can see reason. Almost everyone, I would say barring a couple of people that I've I've actually, uh, people who have left uh, my left my team or company, I'm still very good friends with. And largely because I could make them see reason it's best for us and best for you. Could you not argue that it's your fault? Say there's a skill gap, there's a knowledge gap. Your process wasn't, not yours, but like the hiring process wasn't rigorous enough to determine that in the process. 100% right. 100% right. And it's most times it is that because at the end of it, think about it. It's a two-way thing. If I knew what I knew two months later, would I have done? Hiring is a, is a terrible process. I mean, I know you ask a ton of questions of what do you look for? What do you look for? And all that. Honestly, I can say all I want, it's useless. At the end of it, you, it's easiest when they work with you or you ask referrals from people you really care about. That's the only one that really, really works. You can do something in the interview, judge a few things. And even I said this, like, oh, simplicity and all this nonsense. But honestly, <laughs> you know, just don't know until they join. There is so many unknowns here. They just really don't know. I, I, I listen, I love that. It makes me feel a little bit better because I've made many mistakes. You, you said like, we just don't know, we just don't know. Before we move into a quick fire, why do so many senior execs fail, Chandra? I'll say two different uh, answers to it. One answer is that I think uh, what I've noticed is that this happened even at Facebook and, uh, and while I worked with over 100 portfolio companies, I think there are, I think of it as from an exec perspective, I think there are uh, three types of execs. People who know how to take companies from bad to okay and people who know how to go from okay to good and there are people who are good at going from good to great. I mean, Chris Cox, excellent exec for going from, at Facebook, Chris Cox was excellent at good to great. I don't think he was good at okay to bad to okay, which means that bad to okay requires a lot of firing. This whole thing is bad. Turn them around. Get a completely new gun. And you have to have a different type of mindset to be able to do that. The good to great are people who are superb at being visionaries, who are able to to bring everyone along. Everything is already in a decent place. They can know what kind of products you need to be dreaming for the next stage of evolution of the company. They're fantastic at it. What ends up happening is that at least at the levels at which I have seen newer execs even chief product officers, etc., whatever execs you look at, what ends up being is that they, you just go by resume and say, oh, let's do this. You don't actually ask the question of what does the company actually need? And it ends up being that it's not the same type of um, person who can do all three or four of these things. And at Facebook, I knew that there were, and I won't name them, but there are execs who are superb at bad to okay. They were superb at, at good to great, like I pointed out. And so knowing that is a huge thing. So that's one reason I think execs fail is just not. Second, it's just the fact that I, I think they have a very strong opinions of what they they think they need to be doing. I mean, for example, when I came to Facebook from PayPal, uh, the first week or two, I, I mean, I'd worked on risk for so many years and I said, okay, I was an expert. I must be this, I must know more than these guys. I've done this for so many years. So this arrogant me went and basically the first week or two went and told them, hey, do this or do that or do this. And I remember Dan Levy, uh, who was my manager there at Facebook, told me, you know what? You may be right, but you need to bring these people along. And what you're actually doing is that, and by the way, you should be listening more. You're just actually talking as though you know everything. And the thing there is that I, and I, I obviously took the feedback to heart and, and, and have been trying to change it across almost anything in life. But I, I actually, that's what it is. You, you think you know, and you've done this before. You know what it is. You come in there, you have notions of how what works, what doesn't work, and it, that's not reality. 
That's not reality on the floor. How does the skill set before a quick fire I promise, but how does the skill set change between those that are good to great and bad to okay? Like w- what different people are they? As I mentioned, great at strategy, great at vision, not that great, not necessarily great at execution, uh, great at at uh, bringing people along and making people feeling great about it, empowering the next set of leaders to be amazing, all the kinds of things that you want. The bad to okay is like, is like essentially firing their entire squad, giving very hard messages, saying everything is crazy, having a center set of loyal groups of people that they can bring on who can completely change everything and then have a sort of, they got to get into this very strong execution mode. I want to get shit done. I need to go to, okay, that's all I care about. They're like a machine and they don't care that much about how, how do people feel, how does... Uh, should I make people, everyone happy, culture, none of that actually matters. It matters only when you get to okay. But in the process, you don't need to be. So you are so much tougher in how you handle it. And so, and you need both. You actually need to go inside a company, you need to do both. But not the same person can do it. You can't get the same person to do both. They don't, they don't even think like that. Listen, I could talk to you all day, Chandra. I, so I'm going to do a quick fire. So I say a short statement, you give me your immediate thoughts. Does that sound okay? Sounds good. What are the biggest mistakes you see founders make when hiring for growth or analytics teams? As I mentioned, I, I think uh, it's what I said earlier. It's basically looking at, uh, um, I would say a lot of it has got to do with the with uh, looking at asymptote versus uh, slope. I actually think that uh, not the right person, you have to find the right person for your company, not look at this amazing profile of someone who's done some amazing stuff in some amazing company that doesn't work for you. Can I ask, you seem very calm, Chandra. Do you ever lose your composure? Occasionally. I meditate a lot. So I, I lose occasionally. I, I have different tones to my voice, which basically, uh, for example, the last two months in my company, I've I consciously told them my tone's going to change. I expect far, far more from everyone. And uh, my son realized that pretty early and uh, that I have different tones to my voice, but I'm still under control. I'm under control, but I actually can uh, have a very calm demeanor or I can I can not necessarily scream but I can uh, amplify my tone to a point of showing sense of urgency talk to me about the meditation I'm just intrigued it's something that I would like to be getting into what's your meditation process today and how do you do it quick story on that I used to stutter a lot until I was in my ninth grade um, and back in India and I used to stutter a lot and uh, one of my uncles basically was uh, in a hypnosis group and he self he hypnotized me and then taught me self hypnosis and i couldn't finish one sentence and uh, and uh, after hypnotized during the process of hypnosis which i don't know but he recorded it on tape and he asked me to say multiple sentences and i never stuttered and so he taught me self hypnosis and i started to hypnotize myself and Within six months, I stopped stuttering. And then I realized uh, self-hypnosis was the same as meditation. So I call it meditation now. So I don't even know what form it does. I just, uh, I haven't formally learned it in any form, but I I just uh, close my eyes, relax. A lot of times I just may meditate even unconsciously, like you would be in, in, a, in a flow. So I just go into the flow when I go deep into things. I don't even know what I'm doing and I'm I, I actually may meditate without knowledge. So do you, do you repeat a singular phrase or word? Do you have any process or exercise in terms of retaining kind of focus on purity of mind and avoidance of distraction? I'm yeah, just I try to observe myself and see the stream of thoughts and try to see whether I can see myself as a third person. And then while I do that, I, I try to see whether I can take the thought back to its origin and see it as a third person. And if I'm able to do that, uh, my my mind gets less and less cluttered and then at some point goes blank. But I don't know that it's been blank until I can look at the clock an hour or two later and then see that, oh, two hours passed and I didn't sleep. Must I must have meditated. <laughs> Tell me, what's the hardest part of being a founder? Keeping your customers happy. I, I think the customers are happy, but if I have a, such a high bar for them, I just constantly feel like I'm... There's more to do. There's so much more to do with the customers. And that's probably what uh, the hardest part is to build an amazing product that makes 
our customer is so happy. What would you most like to change about the world of growth? One of the things that we don't do enough is counter metrics. And uh, I think I see, saw that at PayPal and at Facebook, where you would grow a metric like uh, at PayPal, for example, there were two teams. One was growing revenue and then one was actually stopping revenue, which is fraud. And uh, neither team had the other as a counter metric. So the the PayPal's growth team would keep increasing revenue and the fraud team would keep stopping them, but neither wanted the other to succeed or they, they didn't put it as a counter metric. And if the two teams can work together, uh, two different metrics which can actually um, fight with each other, you know, and be in conflict is a big problem. So you should have counter metrics. I totally agree with you. And I agree that we don't have enough counter metrics. What would you say that has been the biggest shift in your mindset? What have you changed your mind on in the last 12 months? I think this goes back to growth itself. I think growth is a is much, much harder problem than I initially thought it was. And I think partly because if you want to do growth really, really well, you need a great infra. You need to have great people with ta high talent density. You need to have people, you, you need to have essentially uh, um, people that can identify opportunities and execute and have the right process for it like we had at Facebook is understand, identify, execute. Then you need to have uh, the leadership buy-in and making sure that you can have the, the right uh, leadership to be able to evangelize for growth. And if you don't, it's that. The fifth one is the one I talked about, impact. I think if you don't focus on impact, it's hard. And to get all of them right is super hard. And I, I realized that when I worked with so many companies now is that some of this or one of this fails, either they don't have the great talent density or they don't have the right infrastructure. They don't have a, you know, a infrastructure in terms of doing A-B testing or if they don't have the right leadership in place to basically uh, say that this is really important or set the wrong goals which also is a big problem that you can actually set the wrong goals. All this can be problems. You worked with Mark for many years at Facebook. What was your biggest takeaway from working with him? Being able to uh, up level to the highest level and go to, you know, the 10 feet level is incredible. So he would be able to say, here, we want to become, I mean, we are going to be a mobile first company or something. And that's essentially what he wants us to do. And then he will outlay in a five-page document on every single why it is, and then he'll talk about the strategy, and then why it is that important, important, then he'll talk about the strategy, then he'll talk about every single team and the roadmap for each team, and get to the level of, he won't get to the level of which person does what, but he gets to the level of roadmap, maybe even, in, and then even initiatives inside of it. He may not get to the specific tactics and, and, and so on, but his ability to go all the way from the top, take a big problem, break it down all the way down to initiatives uh, for such a large problem in a five-page document, which I think he writes in such short time. I mean, I think he wrote his S1 in one sitting on a mobile phone. I mean, it's astonishing. Listen, Chandra, I've, I've loved doing this. Thank you so much for putting up with my very moving questions. And you've been an incredible guest. Thank you so much, Harry. It was actually so much, so much fun. I'm, 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 I'm delighted and great chatting with you.